Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us today. We were, uh, we were recently on a drive, enjoying some of the scenery here in, um, in the Smoky Mountains. Beautiful place, uh, a place we'd never visited before, at least I hadn't. I hadn't um, either. When we shared our things to do in Tennessee, one of you guys reached out and said that we should go to, was it the Roaring Forks mm -hmm. Automobile Trail? And it was beautiful. I was a little taken back by a few of the pullouts and just seeing you could just see ridge after ridge of mountains and it just mm -hmm. it just took your breath away. It was it was so beautiful. So thank you so much for recommending that to us. We thoroughly enjoyed our drive. But as as we were out there, a chance to drive, a chance to talk. In approaching this season, you know, Thanksgiving is coming up and you know, it's just a really healthy time to reflect on the blessings that have um, you know, that we've experienced that we've been given. So often we're tied up with our um, you know, concerns and the things that are kind of hard in life or going bad or, you know, just not how we want them. And really, um, if we take the time to stop and think, think about it, you know, there are blessings, there are um, things that God has blessed us with along the way and even, you know, currently. So we thought we would just stop and um, talk about a few things towards that end, specifically in relation to uh, contentment and dealing with jealousy. This isn't necessarily uh, something recent or that started recently. This goes back several years. Um, back into my childhood and it's just something that I think personally sometimes when the holidays should be full of joy and gratitude and time with family I have battled different times with being content with where I'm at in a phase of life and different different portions that were difficult yeah before Michael kind of goes into that and going back a few years in time um, you know in relation to this subject matter you know, contentment is a hard thing to, um, it's not a hard thing to experience, but so often we don't choose to experience it because our eyes are on other things that we don't have. Oftentimes it's not needs, it's, it is wants, but still they, they grip us. Um, they, they consume our minds so often. And it's so easy to, um, to have our joy robbed because mm -hmm. we're focusing on those things. The source of happiness or joy or lasting contentment you know, it's it's a lesson we've had to learn, but it really doesn't rest in those things. For me, with each age, new experience in life, there's another lesson in contentment to learn or another mm -hmm. thing that I battle with jealousy. Like it's a constant learning process. Um, in my early childhood, I remember being very, very jealous of my sister Erin, who was incredibly talented on the piano. And I wasn't gifted musically. I enjoyed music, but it took so much work for me. and to this day, I regret that I gave up on my music lessons because I couldn't see the bigger picture that one day we would both be married and we would live in different places and we could use music in different ways. And I, I let it consume me and I let it rob some of my joy. I let it rob accomplishment that I could have gained had I put my heart to it. But at different phases, I think those things change with age, with schooling, with marriage, just different phases. As I started facing those challenges of jealousy and comparison, I didn't realize early how much of your joy it can take and how much it can just begin to consume your mind. At first, it just seems like something, well, I wish I had that. But then letting it live in my mind and grow, it can become all consuming to where um, there's a touch of bitterness or definitely a discontentment where you start to not find enjoyment in the things you do have. I remember, you know, going back to my teen years especially and noticing the people that were um, kind of the favorites in the crowd and, you know, they had they had something that I didn't have, you know. Um, their popularity, they were, you know, either funnier or smarter or more athletic or something like that. And, you know, we all have those experiences, right? But it was, um, I remember how easy it was to really um, think of myself as less valuable because I didn't have what they had and, and I wasn't valued in man's eyes like they were. And so I really thought that, um, that that dictated a lot of my perception of myself and my value. I remember a time realizing that person doesn't have more value than I do in God's eyes. Mm -hmm. I'm also not more valuable than that other person, you know, so it's not like having one up on somebody else here, but we all have value in God's eyes and he created us intentionally, purposefully, knowing that my life had a purpose mm -hmm. and that God wanted to use me in some way. It's just like 
you know, when I come to the end of my life, um, it's, it's not somebody else's advantage that defines what, what I'm supposed to do or the value I have or what I was meant, you know, created for. My mom is my hero when it comes to contentment. Um, she just smiles all the time. I don't recall my mom ever complaining about anything. Um, she's had a lot that she could complain about, a lot of morning sickness and late nights and caring for kids and homeschooling, but she's just the most content person I know, but I know from her talking with us and sharing that it was also something that she learned. And I remember being really young and her just trying to be open and honest with us and share with us kids as we grew up and prepare us that our lives are gonna look different because there were a lot of us and different ones of us struggled with jealousy and she would try to explain to us that God has a very specific purpose for you individually and you're gonna have a different life partner, you're gonna have a different home, you're gonna have a different ministry, you're gonna have a different job. I remember different times, one of our favorite things as a family was to go yard selling on Saturdays and we would, you know, we'd stop at so many yard sales but with the nature of yard sales, there wouldn't be something for everybody at the first yard sale. And just her helping us take those moments that were teachable. Somebody got something at the first yard, yard sale and then somebody different got something at the second yard sale. And throughout the day, we would all eventually get something, but it would just help us to learn. Like sometimes you have to be patient and sometimes as much as mom would love to buy everybody something at the first one, it just wasn't available or there wasn't something that that child would appreciate. And I just remember my mom loving to yard sale and never ever getting anything for herself, but she would go with a checklist to get something for each child that she thought they would specifically enjoy. And we would take turns all getting out and shopping for things. And she would be so happy in giving us something that she knew we would like. And that really has helped me as I've gotten older, both watching her example and then trying to learn those lessons that God really is seeking our good, and He gave me the things that I need to serve Him best, and I can focus on everybody around me and limit my ability to minister, or I can work through those things and thank Him for how He's blessed me and try to pursue the calling that He has for me individually. Another thing that mom would often share when we were little is there will always be somebody smarter than you, there will always be somebody prettier than you, there will always be somebody who's better academically, who's more talented, but that doesn't need to limit what you can do because we each have a specific gift. So some of the battles that, you know, I've worked through that I feel like God has been trying to teach me over the years was, um, I mentioned um, ability of others that can easily wrap your joy. I also struggled with comparing myself physically to what my sisters looked like instead of realizing that we were made unique and we would marry different people and different people would be attracted to us. I let it consume me for a time. I battled some with my weight and I let it, I let it become a consuming thing that was unhealthy. Um, not necessarily in eating, but in my mind. And that was just something that I had to learn to be content in. And it took time. I had to go to scripture and realize that God said he made me fearfully and wonderfully. He knew me before I was formed in my mother's womb. He chose my physical features and learning to be okay with that and to be grateful for how he made me and realize that he gifted me with specific things for the calling he had in life was really life changing for me to realize that I didn't need to fit a mold. I didn't need to look like somebody else and their calling and joy and passion in life wasn't necessarily mine. And I didn't need to change who I was to fit into what someone else was. Also, a key in all of this too, um, I feel like this was something learning more in recent years, but that God wants to showcase His grace through us, um, His creation. And His grace depends on, that grace being showcased through a person is dependent on the humility of that person. And when I realized that, it's just like, God God wants to do amazing things through my life by His grace, but am I gonna humble myself before God so that He can get through? When grace comes in, there's so many other things that just, it doesn't matter anymore. Um, that I guess that, uh, that false value system or whatever you would call it, it's just like, 
it's dethroned because something more valuable is there and it's from God. And it, but it's, it's alive, it's working, it's doing something, it's going somewhere. And I, could, I found satisfaction when I began to experience that. And it's just like, my life was so wrapped up on what I could see, who I could see, engage myself that way, when in reality, it is about standing before God and receiving from Him. And when His grace is active in my heart and in my life, it really does produce a contentment for anything. Mm -hmm. The next thing that I struggled with was singleness. And I get a lot of messages from some of you girls on Instagram that battle with this also. And it was one of the, probably the hardest challenge that I've been through was learning to be content in the single years. I always thought that I would get married really young and have a large family. And that was something that God did not, well, to some of you, you may think I got married young. I was almost 26. To others of you, that may seem old, but I had younger sisters that were married before me. And especially during the holiday season, I really, really struggled with feelings of loneliness and not being content instead of learning how to embrace where I was at and enjoy the freedom of singleness, enjoy the family that I had because I was surrounded by a loving family. I let um, not being in a relationship turn some of those holiday days that could have been delightful into self-pity and kind of misery, just feeling lonely. Experiences have been more of a struggle for me than things. Um, but one of the things that really challenged me, I was in my early 20s and reading through Philippians and Paul said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And understanding that contentment is a learned thing. It doesn't come naturally. We're not just born content people. But that passage of scripture really started to change my perspective in learning to enjoy the phase that I was in in singleness. To begin to understand that I had more time to invest in my siblings and my nieces and nephews, in ministry, in travel, in learning, in education. And to start to fully embrace that period of life and yes, still pray for marriage. There's nothing wrong in desiring marriage. There's also people that God calls to singleness, but I had to learn to start to enjoy that phase of singleness and to make the most of it because time passes so fast. And I feel like a little bit, it kind of drug for a time. And I did let it get to a point that it was consuming. I had a crush on Brandon at this phase and he was away at Bible college and just focused on finishing school and serving the Lord. And I had to learn to deal with my emotions and my feelings and my desires to not stuff them, to not push them aside, but to learn to trust God and ask him what he had for me in that single phase so that I didn't look back one day and feel like I had wasted all of those years. There are things to work on. There are things to do. I needed in my teen years to get a workout routine, but my struggle with jealousy was more over the things that I couldn't change. Um, I have a large birthmark that goes down my neck. Um, it's faded some as I've gotten older, but it was quite dark in my teen years and I was so insecure about it. And I compared um, to a lot of people, why did I have that? And that's just something that I couldn't change, that I just needed to learn to be content in it was different. It wasn't something anybody in my family had. When I was younger, my eyes were bluer and I wanted them to be brown. Um, it's my favorite color. But then when I turned 12, 13, they turned green. I'm grateful for it now, but it took years. I'm so glad. I love green eyes. So <laughs> blessing for me. It took years for me to be okay with that, but that's something God gave me. And instead of being grateful for it and being grateful that I had vision and that I could see, I let something that was completely out of my control make me compare myself with others. I've come to realize when you're busy comparing and when you're jealous, it continually grows. And soon you, you really have no joy in that area. There can be joy in other areas, but in that area, you can just really allow the devil to steal it. And I think that jealousy and discontentment is one of the most silent thieves of of our joy 
But with some of those things, I began memorizing the book of Ephesians in my later teens. And that book just radically changed the way that I viewed myself because it went through affirmation after affirmation of how God views me, that I'm loved, that He's given me everything through Jesus Christ, that um, there's just so much in that passage. There's so much purpose in everything that God has given individually. But then you see the difference in how you're meant to work in the body of Christ, and everybody has a different role. Mm -hmm. When I realized that how God designed everybody he designed them different, but to function in a unified way. So everybody provides something else to the whole, but they themselves are unique. And as a point of confession here, um, th to this day, there are things that come along in life where I find myself completely dissatisfied. Like I'm disappointed about how things went or how things are going or what's happened. God reminds me at those times, it's just like, he reminds me of specific things he has provided. And in those moments, I have a choice. We can choose to stay discontent. It's just like, no, I don't like it. And I'm going to stay in this frame of mind. But God does provide an out. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's, it's up to me to choose when he highlights that. And I think there's different phases where there is a time where it's healthy to grieve certain things. Um, mm -hmm. Things that we don't have lack of um, currently not having children. And that is something that is difficult and you can't just be content 100% of the time and everything's perfect. Um, there is an element of it's not natural to not have children and there's something wrong and we do lack that, but also not letting it be something that consumes and takes away our joy in marriage and our joy in life and in time with our nieces and nephews and the joy in other people who or welcoming a baby into the world because those are also things to celebrate. And at different times, the discontentment with not having children has robbed me of the joy that we have as a couple. And then God would bring back to my mind the years of longing to be married and to have somebody to share these burdens with and to walk through life with. And even though not everything in all of life will always look exactly like we want it to, there will always be needs, there will always be wants. There is something beautiful in finding the positives and it doesn't you know, eradicate the grief or the lack, but it does help the focus to shift that you can enjoy, or at least that I can enjoy what God has given. It's the easiest thing, it's the natural thing to be aware of what we don't have. You it know, is. it's just, it takes some intentionality mm -hmm. to step back, to stop and think, what are the blessings that I do have? that I'm not recalling to mind very frequently, that I'm not remembering. This is something that God is doing, that God has given. And it's just like, wow, you know what? I was not thinking about that. Mm -hmm. And it sure helps to remember it. It really does. I think the perspective is so much because it is, you have to deal with the reality of where you're at with um, sometimes the lack, the things that you need or want, but also when you bring in the gratitude and the positives and the things that God has given, it balances that out so that there's joy and contentment and satisfaction in the midst of hardship. It's not about ignoring hardship necessarily and overcome with positive thinking, but I think the main point in all of this is what brings us back to the point of faith where we realize God is on the throne, He is in control, and He has been good to us and He has blessed us. When we're discontent, that means our eyes are off on other things. When we come back to that point of faith and remember, you know, God, you are good and you are you are being good to us. You mm -hmm. have done good to us. It, it causes the gloom to go away it and does. and it gives strength for the hardships going forward. You know, it's, it's, again, it's not taking those away, but there is so much more strength to face them now because we know, you know what, God's got this, he's got me and he's providing for me and, um, and really, blessing us beyond what we could ask or think in so many ways. Mm -hmm. It's kind of been on my heart because there have been so many questions that come through and I know um, the holiday seasons can be hard. Sometimes you have had um, different ones of you have shared that there's been loss in your life and different things that are really tragic and very painful and trying to find a place of satisfaction and contentment after something that needs so much grief 
is challenging, but I think just reading the book of Ephesians, finding something you can be thankful for, realizing that God is faithful and He will get all of us through. Reflect on the blessings that we have been given and then with Christmas coming up, the, the blessing of Jesus Christ and that He mm-hmm. came and that there's eternity to look forward to. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this time. Mm-hmm. Um, it's some, some hard lessons we've had to learn, but mm-hmm. they have been um, so rewarding. And the ultimate reward in all of it is that, you know, God is good. He does mm-hmm. love us and He is um, He is at work in our lives. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, to, to bring Himself glory and to produce good in our lives as well. And that's a fulfilling state, you know, to live in. Mm-hmm. So we are we are grateful, mm-hmm. and God's grace does strengthen us for the hardships that continue to have to be battled. You know, those don't stop, but God is faithful, and He yeah. is good, and um, we're just very, very thankful for all He's given us. So uh, we're also thankful to you for joining us for this time, um, and we hope to see you next time.